Well, good morning. My name is Terry Fine, and I'm a docent at the Bowers Museum. And today, I welcome you to the exhibit called Gemstone Carvings Masterworks by Harold Van Pelt. And today, we're going to take about 30 minutes and look at some of the works of Harold Van Pelt, a master stone sculptor, and we'll discuss some of them. And I hope to fulfill the Bowers mission of engaging visitors of all ages with the universal messages of the world's culture. So, first of all, how many of you have ever heard of Harold Van Pelt? <laughs> Well, I hadn't before I started studying this exhibit in 2017. And interestingly enough, a couple weeks ago, I met a father of, uh, at a children's breakfast that I work with on Tuesdays. And he told me he was interested in rocks. And I told him about this tour I was giving. And I said, have you ever heard of Van Pelt? And he said, well, of course. He's a rock star. So pardon the pun, but Harold Van Pelt is a rock star among people who know about Jim Stone Cutting. And this is a photograph I have of Harold. And you can see him at work. And uh, Harold has been carving for about 50 years. Um, also, what I like about the detail in this photograph is you can see his instruments that he uses. You can see the stone that he's working on. And you can also see the cloth that he has around it to protect himself from what's shattering and also to keep the stone protected. So, uh, Harold is at my calculation, 97 years old. And he and his wife came to the Bowers in 2017 when this exhibit first opened. The, um, this, they have exhibited Van Pelt's work, and I say they because Erica, his wife, and Harold are a team, but they've exhibited four times at the Bowers. Today, I hope to show you the talent, creativity, and the imagination of Harold Van Pelt, and how he works with the shapes of nature, and also how he uses classical shapes from history to create his sculptures. So let's turn now and let's look at this riton here. So everybody come closer. And uh, does anybody know what a riton is? No? Well, it's a drinking vessel. So this is Harold's modern riton, and I have some ancient ritons here, and you might have seen them in pictures, but this is a silver one from Turkey, um, 5th century BCE, and they're usually modeled after ungulates or hoofed animals, and this one is an ancient Greek riton, and it's made out of pottery, again from the same century. So they're very old, and uh, I think they're symbols. But I have a, a story to tell you about this riton, but first I'll tell you that Harold carved it out of agate, and generally agate is pink and gray, and this particular one was pink and gray, but Harold dyed it for these beautiful colors, and he put it in a bucket of dye for about a week until he got the color that he wanted. But I want to tell you my story, uh, Van Pelt and his wife are friends of Dr. Keller and his wife, and Peter Keller is the president of the Bowers Museum. So when Dr. Keller went on a trip once to Europe, he saw a riton that he admired. And when he got home, he told an artist that he would like him to make him a riton. So this artist did make it. And then when Van Pelt was visiting in Dr. Keller's home, he saw this riton and he thought to himself, hmm, I think I can do better than that. So what Van Pelt did was he made 
this right time for Dr. Keller. Uh, he wanted to make a better one. And another interesting story about Rytons comes from President Obama. And in 2013, President Obama and the United States government were in negotiations with Iran because after 44 years, we were trying to establish diplomatic relations with them again. And so President Obama wanted to do something to show the people of Iran our respect and our friendship for them. So he called in an Iranian specialist, and the specialist said, well, you know, we confiscated a Riton that was coming into our country illegally, and it's in a warehouse in Queens, and I think a very nice gesture would be for you to give back that Riton. So that is what President Obama did, and this is that Riton. And what happened is that he gave it to the Iranians, and the next day, our government received a call, and the Iranians said, we would like to talk. And so, Raitans are symbols of friendship. And I think that you can see that there's three places here for drinking, and I think that goes along very well with friendship, and also the story that I just told you about Van Pelt and Dr. Keller. So, Harold Van Pelt borrows from classical shapes, like the Riton, but he also uses the shapes of nature, like you see here. And here we have a beautiful undulating bowl that I think mimics water, mimics nature, and it's of moss agate, and it's very beautiful. And here we have a bivalve shell. And the shell was meant for a gift to Dr. Keller, and so here it is. And um, it's beautiful. It can be the only object that we have here classified as jewelry because it contains a brooch. And do you know anything about surprises inside of creations? Does that remind you of any other artist? Who might that be? Fabergé. So this is in the style of Fabergé that when you open it, you have this beautiful piece of jewelry. And this is a rare blue-green tourmaline inside. It's surrounded by diamonds and Japanese biwa pearls. And another story with this, when the, uh, Van Peltz made this for Dr. Keller, they designed it so it opened and closed. And there's a little motor in it that um, fosters that opening and closing. But they were dismayed because it made too much noise. So they decided not to give it to Dr. Keller as a gift. But here we have it. So it all turned out well, both of these gifts, that they're now in the Bowers Museum collection. So have any of you ever carved anything from stone? The last group I, in the last group I had, there was a woman who had done that. She said it was really hard. And so to carve from stone is a very difficult process. And just to show you how difficult, I have the Mohs scale that jewelers often use, and maybe you have seen it before, but the softest a stone is talc, and of course baby powder is made out of that, so that gives you an indication. And diamonds are the hardest stones to work with and to cut. Harold Van Pelt works in the area of quartz, which is the seven on the Mohs scale. So what he does is very difficult and takes him a very long time. So now I would like for us to go into our gallery and we're going to look at a vase. And a lot of times when I'm in this gallery, I see people put their heads in and then they leave because they see these two objects. And what do you think they think that these objects are made out of? Glass. Glass. And so they look at them and they think, oh, I've seen things like that before. But then when you tell them that they're made out of quartz, it's a totally different mindset. Glass is melted sand and it's blown or it can be molded, but quartz is a very different process and I've, as I've said, it takes Van Pelt many stages and much time to do this. He says there's four stages of cutting, sanding, sawing, and doing it all over again and then the end process is 
um, polishing with a diamond cloth and I think he does that four times but this container is made from a piece of quartz and uh, it caused a lot of stir when it was first installed because it has an inclusion and an inclusion is basically material or sediment that is in the quartz and probably a lot of gemstone cutters spend a lot of time finding rocks and gems that don't have inclusions. So when this first was displayed, people kept saying to the fan pelts, oh, how did you do the hummingbird? How did you do the hummingbird? And they thought, I don't know what, we don't know what they're talking about. So they came to the back of the container and they saw the hummingbird that everybody was talking about. But to me it just shows that the artist, Van Pelt, was looking at it in a totally different way. And uh, on top is a lid and it's made of chalcedony, another type of quartz, and the crystals are really large. So while we're at this case, let's also look at this vase and um, this was um, intended to be hollow but there was an accident that happened so I'd invite you all to come around and look and see if you can find the accident scene on this, In this, this particular vase yes where's the accident scene on the right like a crack mm -hmm. yes a crack yes on the, kind of on the left and, and so what Harold wanted to do was throw it away. Would you have done that? <laughs> no. Well, Erica said, no, don't throw it away. I have an idea. And her idea was to make a window and band it with gold and to have some tourmalines made and set inside. And I think that shows the wonderful partnership that they have with each other. So now you might be wondering how Harold Van Pelt got started in this hobby, because he is known as a hobbyist, not a professional, by European standards. He didn't go through an apprenticeship, but he learned everything on his own. But Harold Van Pelt went to the Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, and he graduated in 1953, and he became a portrait photographer. But he got kind of tired of that and he didn't think he was making very much money and then he went to work at a furniture store a furniture store named Levitt's have you ever heard of it do you remember the slogan what was it you love it at Levitt's well evidently Dan Pelt didn't love it at Levitt's so much and he and his wife uh, in other pursuits, started going to the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show, and they became very involved in collecting rocks and gemstones, and their big break came, because Erica was a photographer also, when they were invited to photograph the opening of a tourmaline mine in North San Diego County, in Pala, at the Queen Mine. And so that was really where they had their beginning. And so they um, started photographing gemstones at that point. And I want to show you a tourmaline that they photographed from this queen mine and you can see the tourmaline is beautiful pink and peach colors and also if you look closely you can see the photo credit is from Erica and Harold Van Pelt and this today resides in the Smithsonian hmm. Museum in Washington so as time went on they started to get more sophisticated engagements and they were asked to create covers for high-end jewelers, covers for magazines, and also for gems and gemology magazine. And this is a cover that they both did in 19, I believe it's 1998. So you might wonder how Harold and Erica had the money to do all the things that they did because Harold's never sold any of his work. He's um, He's an artist that enjoys his own work. And so I think that that's probably how they supported themselves because she went on and she continued to photograph 
uh, Jim Stone's. But Harold started working in their uh, downtown loft in Los Angeles where they both lived and also he created these wonderful sculptures. So let's take a look at some of these others and we're going to, I'm going to direct your attention to this beautiful agate container at the very beginning of the cabinet here. And I really like this container because it looks so modern. And I think I really like the autumn colors. <laughs> Those are my favorite colors. And you can see how Van Pelt banded it with gold to set it off. And also there's a beautiful obsidian base there. So Harold doesn't just work in stone, but he also works in petrified wood. So have you ever seen any sculptures made out of petrified wood? Okay, well let's look at one that Harold's done, which is right here. And it's amazing to think that the wood that he used could be up to 12 million years old. I, that always boggles my mind. But petrified wood is basically a fossil, and what happens is the material decays and it's pressed down over time and then water runs through it and what is left is the fossil or in this case the outline of the wood and pyrite or other minerals fill in so you can see this beautiful grain so this is what petrified wood looks like in the forest this is a forest in Arizona have any of you ever been to a petrified wood forest and I think it's, again, pretty amazing that he can make artwork out of petrified stone. So now I'd like us to turn our attention to something more colorful than the petrified wood. And today we're not going to stop at all of the creations, but I invite you to come back after our time together and look at them more closely. But now we're going to move to this corner and we're going to look at this beautiful purple wine glass. This is an amethyst cup made out of um, a stone that looks like this. And I think it's so wonderful that um, the way that this is displayed with the object in front of the material that's obviously been polished, but it still gives you an idea of how difficult it would have been to carve this. So there's a st some stories about amethyst that I want to share with you. Now you know that Bacchus was the wine god, and of course he loved wine, and occasionally he got drunk. <laughs> so at one time there was a beautiful maiden walking by. And Bacchus had said previously to this maid before she walked by, whoever walks by next is going to be eaten by tigers. Well, here comes this beautiful maiden, but goddess, Diana, the goddess of love, heard Bacchus say that. And so she did not want this beautiful maiden eaten by tigers. So she froze amethyst into stone. And Bacchus, after a while, realized that he um, had done wrong, and as an offering to Diana, he threw his wine onto the stone, and that's why it's called amethyst, and that's why it's purple. So you can almost see amethyst struggling to get out of this stone here, but it's a nice <laughs> tribute to her. And then another legend um, attributed to Bacchus says that anyone who drinks out of an amethyst cup, who drinks wine out of an amethyst cup, will never be drunk. So the next time, if I ever see Harold Van Pelt, I'm going to ask him if he's tried that, if he's had a lot of glasses of wine from that cup. Now, um, as beautiful as this is, some people might think that the real showstopper in this exhibit is this faceted quartz egg. What do you think? That's um, pretty hard to beat. But again, we have the surprise inside, all those beautiful gems. And um, there's um, 170 facets on the top 
facets, meaning carved planes. And then on the bottom, there's 246, and it's uh, banded with gold. And can't you see this on a magazine cover? I mean, it's truly the movie star of um, this exhibit, I think. But I have another interesting story about this. There's several interesting stories. But uh, when Dr. Keller was interviewing Van Pelt about this egg, he said, well, I guess you're borrowing from Fabergé here. And Van Pelt said, no, not at all. I just find that eggs are a very satisfying shape. And then in another interview he did with Dr. Keller, Van Pelt told him that one day his daughter had come home and she had bought some stockings. And the stockings were in an egg-shaped container. And do any of you remember what that is? Legs. Legs containers. And only on special occasions are these um, manufactured, these containers manufactured now. But if you ever need a pair of stockings, look for legs, because you'll still see these eggs on um, the labels of the stockings. So Van Pelt said that the legs container was the perfect proportion, and that was the model for his um, egg here. Now, um, let's go on and let's look at some other things that Van Pelt has borrowed from history. Um, because he and Erica went to the Eider Oberstein area of Germany, the wood cutting and I'm sorry, wood carving area of Germany, they visited a lot of museums. And one museum that they visited in England was the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he borrowed the design for these crystal candlesticks. These are basically flawless quartz candle holders. And um, these he borrowed from a design in that museum. And then to show you the many different forms of quartz, you see one that is green, and that is chrysophase. And the reason that it has the beautiful green color is because of nickel in it. So just very small elements of nickel. And I love the way, again, that the, um, the quartz <coughs> is displayed here so you can see originally what it looked like and what he had to carve. Now, in addition to doing classical shapes and shapes from nature, Van Pelt also likes to use the human body. And so if you turn your attention here, you can see that he too is in the line of many artists that think the body is beautiful and definitely worth modeling. Um, these are all modeled after, uh, on his wife Erica's body. And the first one we'll look at is this hand here that's anatomically correct and it's in chalcedony which is really perfect for recreating bones. Um, whenever I see this I always wonder if he was working from an x-ray. What do you think? It looks like it. And then also um, the question has been asked are these glued or are they hinged. And to tell you the truth, I don't really know. I suspect they may be hinged because the Van Pelts were very uh, careful that they didn't want anything to come apart and they took things apart in pieces. And so when you see these gold bands, uh, they can be lifted off and stored. So what we have in the foot here and in the other hand is called rutilated quartz. Has anybody ever heard of that? Well, it's made <coughs> with needles of titanium dioxide that get trapped in the quartz. And uh, we don't know how that happens. Uh, it's in our materials that no one really knows. And when there's been geologists that have come into this exhibit, I always say, well, is that true? We don't know how these are formed. And they say, yes, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So rutilated quartz can be very dense uh, with lots of needles, or it can be um, 
clear, almost clear. And we have several of those models here. And then we also have another piece of rutilated quartz over here, the very large piece in the corner. And then there's a smaller piece here, uh, which shows you the beauty of those. Now, I think that if we had time, I'd like to have a contest for naming this book. <laughs> and um, what would you name it? I've had a lot of time to think about my title for it, but does anybody have any suggestions for naming it? Mercury's right foot. Okay. <laughs> I think the ritilated quartz works well with the foot because there's so many bones in the foot. There's 26 bones. Okay, any other names? Well, I've decided that it's walking on pins and needles because I think about all the nerve endings that we have in our feet and how sensitive it is. And sometimes when I have foot pain, that's what I think about. So in addition to hands and feet, Harold Van Pelt has also specialized in skulls. So we're going to turn over here and look at this skull, which he named Isaac. And the reason that it's named Isaac is because it contains isoclachite, which is like titanium dioxide. They're little needles of silver throughout. And so that's why he named it Isaac. I think Harold Van Pelt is very clever. So this started with a 250 pound uh, block of quartz. And this will show you the extreme difficulty in what Harold Van Pelt does. And in fact, he says the most difficult part of all of this is finding the stones large enough to carve. And he and Erica have been all over the world trying to find the right stones. A lot of them come from the Western United States and some come from South America, but really from all over. So this started out as 250 pounds and now, and then it went to 52 pounds, and now I believe it's 6.5 pounds. So what is interesting about this skull is it's anatomically correct and the jaw hinges and unhinges. Um, once I was here touring and a doctor came in and she said, this person had a disease. And I thought, oh, I can't even imagine knowing what that would be. But she was very interested in it from a medical standpoint, not from the sculpting. Um, but there's a story with this as well. When, um, Harold Van Pelt realized that he really enjoyed doing skulls. It kind of became his signature. But early on, he had an accident where one shattered. And you can imagine the heartbreak of that. And so he was so upset that it took him several days to tell Erica. But he did, and she encouraged him to get started again. And so the Van Pelts, as I said uh, before, are very conscious of taking apart their objects and storing them because they have been concerned about the vibrations of earthquakes and also their black cat. And so I know that they're very happy to have them in the Bowers Museum. So um, I hope that you have learned about Harold Van Pelt today and can appreciate the beauty um, that he has created through stones and also the way he pays tribute to classical sculptors and also the way he reflects nature. And I think that he does fulfill the Bowers message of bringing universal messages of cultural diversity because he incorporates so many of them into his works of art. Uh, also, there is a wonderful catalog that you can buy in our gift shop or our museum store if you want to know more about the works of Harold and Pelt, and it's called Gemstone Carvings. And there's several interviews with Dr. Keller in this catalog, which are of great value. So today, I hope that you'll take some time and you'll have lunch in Tangata. It's a fabulous 
restaurant and then go to the gift store. And I also hope that you'll think about buying a membership to the Bowers Museum because when you buy a membership, you can come many, many times for a low price. And we have so much coming up. So I hope that you'll come back again and again.